All right, turn to Acts chapter 20, verse 16, if you would, please. Acts chapter, hold your place in 21. And uh, go to Acts 20, verse 16. I want to do a little review. I need to point a few things out. So, Acts chapter 20, Paul was on his third missionary journey. Or Acts 21, Paul is still on his third missionary journey. And Paul is, one of his main focuses of this journey was to go around and encourage believers and exhort them and encourage them and build them up in the faith. So that's where we're at here. Uh, you know, Paul's still doing that in Acts 21. Let's look at Acts 20:16. We need, like I say, we got to get a little background. I got to lay a little ga- groundwork first from Acts 20. Acts 20, verse 16. For Paul had determined to sell by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So we see Paul, you know, he was going around and he was visiting these churches and spending some time with them, building them up in the faith, preaching to them. But now we see he's in a hurry to get to Jerusalem. And this is important to know when we get to chapter 21 so you can really understand what's going on. I've heard some bad teaching on, on, on chapter 21, on chapter 21. And you need to know why he, you know, you need to know, you need to know that he's in a hurry to get to Jerusalem. And so why is he, why does he want to go to Jerusalem? Look at verse 22, Acts chapter 20, verse 22. Let's find out why he wants to go to Jerusalem. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. Underline that, that's so important. And now I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. So does it sound like the Spirit told Paul to go to Jerusalem? He's under the Spirit's orders to go to Jerusalem. Uh, not knowing the things that should befall me there. Look at verse 23. Let's find out why he wants to go there. Say that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. So it sounds like to me he wants to go to, whole, to, to Jerusalem uh, because he knows the Pentecost is coming up. There's going to be this big festival there, and he wants to witness. The Holy Ghost wants him to go there and witness. That's what it sounds like to me. Verse 24, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So why does he want to go to Jerusalem? Why is he bound in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem? So he can testify of the gospel of the grace of God. (coughs) Pretty clear? Uh, So he has orders from the Holy Ghost to witness, and he doesn't care what lies ahead. I got my marching orders. That's what he says. So let's pick it up in verse 1. Now remember that. Remember that when we get to verse 20, or chapter 21. He's got his marching orders. Uh, look at verse 1. And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course unto Coos, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patara, Patara, or Patara. Now underline straight course. We came with a straight course. I like that term, straight course. That means, look, Paul didn't get sidetracked. He had a mission, he had a plan, he had a goal, he had a game plan, and he didn't let nothing sidetrack him. And I'm just going to use that as a reminder to tell you that's how we need to be. We need to not let stuff get us sidetracked. We need to keep the main thing the main thing. Look, we should do battle, and we should fight false doctrine and false prophets and all that kind of stuff. And look. But if you're not careful, you'll lose focus on the main thing. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And we need to say, folks, yeah, soul winning is not the only thing. There is other things that we should be focused on. You know, focused on our families, focused on uh, preaching the whole Bible, learning doctrine. You know, there's other things. But soul winning is a main thing, all right, that we need to be focused on. And let me just say this. We, when we're out doing the main thing, keep the main thing the main thing. While you're out soul winning, while you're out on the streets doing the main thing, keep the main thing the main thing. What I mean by that is don't get sidetracked. Stay focused on the cross, keep it on the cross. So Larson, I learned, I learned over 20 years ago, and the first time when I first started soul winning, the guy who took me out, Brother Frank Rice, he took me out and discipled me, took me soul winning, carried me into the military barracks. It's like a dorm room. We're witnessing the people. We're in the lounge area. They had a TV. And we're sharing the gospel with people. And some guy said, hey, let me ask you a question. Did Jesus drink fermented wine? 
And all it was was just a ploy of Satan just to get me sidetracked and get me off going down some rabbit trail somewhere. And when we got done, you know, I spent five or ten minutes talking to him about whether Jesus drank wine or not. You know, and after we were done, Brother Frank had to tell me, he said, look, you've got to keep the main thing the main thing. You've got to get focused on the cross. Stay on the cross. Uh, see, people get off topic all the time, and they want to talk about all kind of stuff. Look, be nice, be gentle, but get back on track. Have a goal. Here's the goal, Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Get them to call on the name of the Lord. And look, if they've got legitimate answers, got legitimate roadblocks, that they have questions that are hindering them from calling on the name of the Lord, then answer them, deal with them. But look, the life stories, that stuff can wait. Uh, the uh, uh, Who did Cain and Abel marry? You know, that kind of stuff can wait. You know, just politely, very gently, hey, I'd love to answer that for you, but let, let me go ahead and finish this thought, or let me go ahead and, and make it through the, the Romans road with you. Let me... Let me go ahead and finish these verses up with you, and then we'll talk about that afterwards, all right? So we need, to, we need to have a straight course in life. We need to stay focused. You know, God's given us a ministry also to testify the gospel of the grace of God. The main thing, keep the main thing the main thing. And, uh, you know, that's, that's soul winning. And then while we're, while we're out keeping the main thing the main thing, we need to keep the main thing the main thing. And that's the cross. Get them to the cross. Stay on the cross. Don't get off course. Hey, you can talk about holy underwear with Mormons after you get them to Romans 10, 13. After you share the whole gospel with them. Hey, you can talk about the fact Muhammad's a pedophile with Muslims after you get through the gospel with them. You'll have, you'll have to address all that stuff afterwards. Uh, you get the gospel in on them. If nothing else, at least you're planting a seed and that seed can, can work on them. Uh, that seed can, can, can begin to grow. Look at verse 2. Acts chapter 21 and verse 2. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went abroad and set forth. Now when we, were, when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload her burden. So Paul's on his way to Jerusalem. He's trying to get a straight course. Uh, but he's there, and they're having to take some detours, and now he just took a detour. Or, uh, the, the, the ship had to unlaid her burden. The burden was a heavy load the ship was carrying. Right, so underline that in your Bible. I like that term. For there, the ship was to unlaid her burden. Uh, the ship was to offload her burden, what she was carrying around. She got rid of what she was carrying around. Now that reminds me of how some of you need to stop toting around your burdens. How some of you need to get rid of what it is you're carrying around. Just like this ship, you need to unlaid your burden. Let me tell you one of, the, one of the best things about getting saved is, do you realize that when you get saved, God Almighty, the one who owns a cattle on a thousand hills, becomes your dad. He becomes your father. So you know what that means? All your problems become his problems. I'm so thankful that when I got saved, <clears throat> the King of kings and Lord of lords is my Father, and here's what I can do. Not my problem anymore, God. It's your problem. You, you deal with it. Yeah, Lord, I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm going to do my part. But hey, ultimately, it's your, your problem, Father. You know... <clears throat> I'm going to dust my hands. You know, the Bible says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We should cast our cares upon Him. Yeah, Lord, I know I got laid off. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to go out and put some applications. And until I get a job, my full-time job is going to be trying to find a job. I'm going to do my part. But ultimately, Lord, it's up to you. You know I got bills to pay. You know I got a family to feed. And you're in charge. You're my dad. You're my father in heaven. So the problem's yours, Lord. That's what some of you need to do. Some of you are carrying around all kinds of burdens. And you need to, you need to uh, unlaid your burden. You need to uh, unlaid your burden. You need to give it to the Lord. Let the Lord worry about it. Let the Lord. You do your part. Pray about it. Do your part. But let Him take care of it. Verse 4, Acts chapter 21 and verse 4. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit, 
that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And when he had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way. And they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when he had taken our leave of another, we took ship and they returned home. So let me just say this real quick. It just popped in my head. You know, we see, we see them getting on the shore and kneeling and praying. This kind of reminds me, of, you know, what I've read that one of the first things Christopher, Christopher Columbus did when he discovered, uh, you know, this, this great land we call home was he got out uh, of that ship and got on his knees and prayed and thanked God. And that's one thing that they don't teach you in history books. That's one thing that they have gutted and neutered out of the history books because there's, uh, there's this thing called revisionist history. How they've tried to rewrite history, especially Southern history. They've especially tried to misalign and lie about Southern history and uh, just history in general. And this just reminded me, it just popped in my head about how Christopher Columbus, I've read, did that. And, you know, we do have a godly heritage. Yeah, a lot of our forefathers might have been yoked up with the Masons and Illuminati. And, yeah, there's, there was an agenda, you know, at the start of our country. You can see a lot of these uh, Illuminati signs and symbols in D.C. And, yes, yeah, Satan was at work in the architecture of our country. But I tell you what, we still got a godly heritage. Our forefathers, uh, some of our forefathers weren't Christians, but the majority of the people were. The majority of people in the United States, and that's one of the reasons why God has blessed our country, is because the majority of people in the United States throughout history have been believers in Christ and did honor the Lord, dear fear the, fear the Lord, and were Bible believers. You know, that's why they called the down south the Bible belt, because the majority of people, especially down south, were Bible believers. All right, but that just popped in my head. But let me point out to you again that these disciples uh, and finding disciples, we tear their seven days who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go to Jerusalem. So here we have, I don't, I, it seems like to me it's multiple disciples through the Spirit are telling Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Now, I heard a pastor say that Paul disobeyed the Lord by going to Jerusalem and basically did a bad thing. This pastor said Paul's heart was right, but he disobeyed the Lord. The reason why he disobeyed the Lord is because these disciples are telling Paul through the Spirit. So that's, you know, how God communicated His Word a lot was through the Spirit. They didn't have the entire written Bible like we do. And I heard this pastor say that Paul disobeyed the Lord. He should have heeded their word. Because they were telling him through the Spirit. So that means that it's just basically like as if God was saying it. <clears throat> well, I thought back in chapter 20, Paul was bound by the Holy Spirit as well. I thought Paul already had his marching orders by the Holy Spirit. Didn't we see that already? Ready? So here's what I believe is going on. Well, how do you reconcile this? Hey, let me tell you, here's what I believe is going on. These disciples knew through the Spirit what was going to happen to Paul. They weren't telling Paul through the Spirit, don't go to Jerusalem. They knew through the Spirit what was going to happen to him. So out of their own fleshly desires to not have Paul hemmed up and thrown in jail and captured, they're trying to persuade Paul not to go. That is what I believe is through the Spirit, who said to Paul through the Spirit, he should not go to Jerusalem. They knew what was going to befall him. Uh, because we already saw Paul had his marching orders from the Holy Ghost to go to Jerusalem. We already saw that. This disciple, or these disciples knew that he would be arrested and tried, and they, they tried to talk him out of it. They knew what was going to happen. Not that the Spirit told him not to go. That could not be true. Because why do we have this conflict here? If the Holy Spirit's telling Paul, binding Paul and the Spirit to go, why would the Spirit be telling, him, telling them to tell Paul not to go? Does it make sense? Yes, so, this tells me, and, and I'll further prove that as we go along, that they're not trying to talk Paul. They're not saying that Paul, the Holy Spirit, told us to tell you not to go. What they're saying is, Paul, the Holy Spirit's told us what's going to happen to you. 
And we don't want you to go. Not that the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to go. We don't want you to go. Now this tells me that Paul knew what he was getting into. He knows it'll be captured. He knows it'll be beaten. He knows it'll be imprisoned. But he's still willing to go all the way through with it. And this makes me respect Paul even more. Because he's willing to go through with it. Look at verse 7. And I'll prove to you more as we go forward. They're not trying to talk Paul out of going through the Spirit. They're trying to talk Paul out of not going through their, through their own selves. What the Spirit revealed to them was just what was going to happen to Paul. Look at verse 7. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to... I don't know where you say that. Potimaeus, and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea... And we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist. Uh, so they're, 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 they're uh, rigging, they're rigging fenders. Uh, that's a Navy term. Uh, you probably have never heard that. They're coming alongside this evangelist. They're hooking up this evangelist. Uh, it says, which was one of the seven above with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So here we're, he's, Paul's running into, he's hooking up with this Philip the Evangelist. Now let me just talk to you a little. Evangelist is only mentioned two times in the Bible that I could find. Let me just talk to you a little bit quickly about what an evangelist is. Evangelist is, this is, this is uh, real, real uh, uh, deep, all right? An evangelist is just somebody who evangelizes people. All right, it's pretty deep, isn't it? All right. <clears throat> so evangelist is somebody that preaches the gospel and gets people saved. And more, most of the time, it, somebody that does that for a full time, for full time, like, like, that's, that's what they do for basically their employment. It's a full-time job. Now, we are all supposed to be doing the work of an evangelist, and especially me. That's one thing that I, I've been commanded to do as a pastor, to make sure I do the work of an evangelist. But this was Philip's full-time job. See, as an evangelist, an evangelist is someone who does just soul winning on a larger scale. I'll prove it to you. Acts chapter 8, verse 5, if you want to turn down. I'm going to be reading this real quick. Uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. So he's going down and preaching Christ to entire cities. And look at verse 40. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So this is like his full-time gig. This is full-time deal. He's probably living, he's living off the, the gospel. They that preach the gospel should live by the gospel. So he's living off the, the tithes and, and the support of God's people. And uh, this is his full-time job here. Now this is what a, a, a biblical evangelist is. A biblical evangelist is somebody who is full-time, basically soul winner, and going around evangelizing and doing that under the ministry of a local church. Now, <clears throat> that's what a biblical evangelist is. Now, this idea of what we have for evangelists today in most Baptist churches is foreign to the Scriptures. There's someone who goes from church to church trying to re revive a bunch of non soul winning moss back deacons instead of going around preaching city, city to city preaching the gospel. The average evangelist that goes around and tours uh, Baptist circles and, you know, he'll preach... He set up meetings at different Baptist churches. The average evangelist never really evangelizes anyone unless he preaches on repentance and turning from sin enough. And if you haven't turned from this sin and you haven't turned from this sin, you're not saved. He preaches on that enough until he convinces a bunch of church members to doubt their salvation. He preaches on that. Hey, if, you're, if you haven't turned from your sins, you're not saved. And, and he preaches that kind of stuff enough People start doubting their salvation and they walk down the aisle and get saved again. That's generally the only people that, that the average evangelist has saved. <clears throat> so a biblical evangelist is just someone who evangelizes somebody. Brother Garrett Kirchway would be a good example of what an evangelist is. He's not a pastor, but what he's doing, he's been shipped out. He's working for the church. He's getting paid by the church. And he's getting shipped out to Indian Reservation. After Indian Reservation, he's getting shipped out, farmed out to do missions trips. He's getting paid by the church. He's working for the pastor. He's serving underneath the pastor. 
And, you know, he's going around teaching people how to soul win. He is a, a perfect example of what a, a real biblical evangelist is. And maybe one day we can afford an evangelist. Maybe we can, one day I can pay somebody to go out and soul win a couple of days a week and send a missions, uh, do, send, uh, to do missions trips and uh, kind of be as an evangelist slash associate of mine, somebody to help me in, in, in labor in the ministry. I'd like to be able to afford that one day. Um, now, let me, let me talk about the fact that this guy Philip, the evangelist, the Bible says in verse 9, And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So a lot of people are confused with this. Why are these young girls prophesying? I thought that was just for men. Well, in the Bible, prophesy just means to proclaim, pro proclaim the word of the Lord. I've proved that before. Uh, I don't have much time now. I've got a lot to cover. And I'm going to be preaching on that during, somewhat during Mother's Day. So I don't want to uh, steal my thunder too much from that. So these young ladies were just going around and uh, uh, preaching, proclaiming the word of the Lord. They weren't preaching from the pulpit. They were preaching on the porch. Not preaching from the pulpit, preaching from the porch. The pulpit's reserved for men. But the porch is open for everybody and anybody. Amen. All right? And that's the one kind of preaching women are supposed to do and they don't want to do. And the kind that they are not supposed to do, it seems like they all want to do it. I wonder how many porches Paula White's preached on. Yeah. I wonder how many porches jo uh, Joyce Myers preached on. Uh, I doubt any because I don't believe either one of them are saved. Amen. I mean, we can just gloss over, just completely gloss over the fact that the Bible says uh, I, 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 uh, that a, a woman should not usurp authority over a man. We just gloss over the fact that, you know, the Bible says a, a, a bishop should be the husband of one wife. We just gloss over the verse that you know, says a woman should be silent in the church. I mean, how can you just gloss over those and not adhere to them except for the fact you're not saved? Especially, you know, most of them preach a false doc gospel anyway. And man, I could go on and on and on about some of those uh, women. Uh, but they're just fleecing the flock is all they're doing. But uh, anyway, Philip is training his daughters right. He's an evangelist. Not only that, but he's teaching his daughters how to evangelize. And I love the fact that the Holy Ghost points out that they were virgins. I love that. You say that seems kind of random. And it is. You know, when we refer to somebody, we're talking about somebody, we're not going to necessarily spell out the fact, hey, these are my, my daughters. Hey, meet Gloria. And by the, or meet Mandy. And by the way, they're virgins. You know, that's pretty, pretty random. That's TMI, right? Too much information. <laughs> but I think the Holy Spirit is spelling this out for a reason. He's given us a recipe to keep our daughters virgins. You want to keep your daughter's virgins, Dad, teach them to prophesy. Good, <clears throat> prophesy. Look, look. Teach them to prophesy and they'll want to stay virgin. They'll want to. Because they'll see all them baby mamas out there, single baby mamas, taking care of a bunch of youngins with some deadbeat, stinking loser sitting on the couch who doesn't even know how to wear a belt, too stinking lazy to get a job, and they want nothing to do with that. They'll want to wait till they get married. So that's one of the ways. But not only that, they'll have God all over them. They'll be full of the Holy Spirit. They're going to want to be virgins if they're out prophesied because they're going to be full of the Holy Spirit. They're going to be walking with the Lord. But not only that, they're going to see the effects of not waiting till you get married. Amen. The baby's mamas will persuade them to wait. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> So there you go, dads. You want a recipe uh, for to help keep your daughters virgins? Make sure they prophesy. Make sure they go soul winning. <clears throat> Philip knew that his daughters were virgin. Let me point that out too. Philip knew enough about his daughters to be able to declare their virginity. And I'm telling you, dads, we should be as we should as well. We should know enough about our daughters 
and know where they've been and who they've spent the night with and where they've gone to be able to declare our daughter's virginity. In the Old Testament, when someone would get newly married and this bum of a man, this deadbeat of a man who had one thing on his mind, who wanted one thing, he would, on his honeymoon night, he would get what he wanted and then he would want to kick his wife to the curb and this is what he'd do. He'd bring up a false accusation against her. He'd say, you know what? I went under her and I found her unclean. She said she was a virgin. She lied to me. If she wasn't, she was unclean. All he's doing, he got what he wanted. It's a false accusation most of the time. He got what he wanted. Now he just wants to kick her to the curb. Um, <clears throat> so he wants an annulment. And he says, she's not a virgin. She lied to me. Guess what? The Bible says the dad was able to produce the tokens of her virginity. Now, I'm not going to get into all that, but the bottom line is he could prove that she was a virgin. Dads, we need to be able to prove that our daughters are virgins. How? How are you going to do that? Because you never allowed them to be unsupervised. Never allowed them to be unchaperoned. My daughter Gloria is 18. She, we finally started allowing her to go out on dates. But guess who she's dragging along? Little brother and little sister. One or the other. And little Mike and Mandy, y'all have been out on some dates with Gloria and Ricky. You let me know. You let me know. If Ricky ever tries to send you off somewhere so he can get a little smooch. All right. You let me know. Now, I'm just kidding. He wouldn't do that because he knows how many guns I own. Uh, but anyway. All right. So, dads, that's how we ensure that our daughters stay virgins. We don't let them have the opportunity to... Not remain pure. Hey, we're all weak. We'd all, we'd all stumble. There ain't a, I don't care. There ain't a, there, I don't care how much she loves the Lord. I don't care how much she soul wins. Hey, dads, there's a gear that can start turning and there ain't no stopping it. So what you do is you keep that gear from ever turning. Amen? Amen. You keep the gears from ever turning. You don't give them an opportunity. Uh, to ever be in a situation where they, could, where they could do something like that. All right, <clears throat> so verse number 10. Let's look at verse number 10. Got to hurry up here. Acts chapter 21 and verse 10. <laughs> and as we tarry there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was coming to us, he took Paul's girdle. Now this always confused me. What, I said, what in the world is Paul doing wearing a girdle? <laughs> my, my, my mama P, my grandmother, I, I remember her saying, I need to go put my girdle on. Look, all a girdle is, it was just a belt. All right, the Bible says gird your loins. Look, look, I don't know if you guys realize it, but you got loins back here in your back. These two pieces of meat that go beside your backbone are called loins. That's what a loin is on a deer. A back strap is a loin. Now, let me put it in redneck terms so some of you rednecks can understand it, all right? A back strap is a loin. You got loins here, and you also got loins in your thighs. Because that, that tendon, it runs up in your ear, also called loins. All right, so um, this is just a belt that he would probably put around his loins to gird, to gird himself up. His overcoat, he probably had an overcoat. And they, they didn't have, uh, and here's another thing, they didn't have zippers. All right, so I know this is real deep and everything, but uh, they didn't have zippers back then. And, and I doubt they had buttons either. You know, they might have had some type of bone or something. But more likely, he just, he had a girdle to tie, tie his coat up when he got cold and when he was walking and stuff. So that's what this is. But anyway, so this prophet comes down. He took Paul's belt and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. So here's what the Spirit was telling them. The Spirit's not telling them to tell Paul not to go. Right. The Spirit's telling them what's going to happen when he does go. Look at this right here. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. See that? You just keep reading and you find out what the Holy Spirit was telling the disciples. Again, I heard bad, bad doctrine on this chapter that, 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 where, where Paul was disobeying the Lord and this, all this kind of stuff. Look at verse 12. And, when, and, and when, when we heard these things, both... And that doesn't mean the, that's, uh, the person's a bad person. It just means, you know, they just uh, maybe 
just weren't very thorough in studying this. And, uh, but anyway, I'm not saying that anybody that preaches that. I, I know some good, I, I've heard a, a specific, one particularly a good man who said that Paul was disobeying uh, the Lord by going to Jerusalem. He's a good man. I, he's just wrong. We're all wrong on some things. Amen. And there's things I've been wrong about when I, I've preached too. So I'm not throwing stones at anybody. But I just want to point out that's bad. That's bad. That's bad teaching. Uh, look at verse 12. And when, when when he heard these sayings, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, "What mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I'm ready not only uh, not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ." And when he would not be persuaded, we see saying, "The will of the Lord be done." So look, if these guys had received a revelation that Paul should not go to Jerusalem, they had a revelation from the Lord, they knew that the Lord said that, then why would they be saying, okay, the will of the Lord be done? Everybody see that? Why would they be saying, the will of the Lord be done? Okay, if it's God's will for you to go, okay, if you say you're bound in the Spirit, okay, if you say you know God wants you to go to Jerusalem because you're bound in the Spirit, then the will of the Lord be done. We know what's going to happen to you, but the will of the Lord be done. Amen. They wouldn't be saying that if God had already given them a clear message that Paul shouldn't be going there. All right? All right. Now, the thing I really like about Paul, love about Paul, one of the many things I really love about Paul is he lived what he preached. Look, Paul said in Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He lived what he preached. He's willing to give his life for the cause of Christ. And we can learn a lot from Paul here. Paul's setting a really good... I heard guys say that Paul's setting a bad example for us, but no, 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 no. Paul's setting a great, great example for us here, uh, willing to lay down his life. Look, we don't want to die. We don't want to be persecuted. But our desire should be like Paul's is to serve the Lord and please Him, come what may. Right. Come what may. Let the chips fall where they may. We just want to please the Lord. We just want to serve the Lord. We need to have this attitude that we're going to do right and we're going to do what the Lord commanded us and we're not going to be scared to go on a mission trip to a dangerous country. Well, we just, we're, going to, we're going to do right. We're going to do what the Lord commanded us to do and we're not going to be scared to go to the ghetto for the mega soul winning marathon and preach the gospel in the roughest neighborhood in San Antonio. Look, we, we should be able to say with Esther, if I perish, I perish. I'm just going to try to do my best to, to, to please the Lord and live for Him and, and do what He wants me to do. And if I perish, I perish. Now, we should be smart about it. You know, take some pepper spray. You know, don't go out at night. You know, ladies, you need to stay in earshot of men, you know, when we go in these rough neighborhoods or, or have one close by. But look, we'll, you know, we're going to do our part, but ultimately we should have the attitude, look, if we perish, we perish. So again, Saul's, Paul's friends plead with him not to go. But he knew he had to because he knew that's what God wanted him to do. He was bound in the Spirit. He knew he had to go to Jerusalem. Our desire to please the Lord should overshadow our desire to avoid hardships and sufferings. Let me say that one more time because it's extremely important. Our, our desire to please the Lord should overshadow our desire to avoid hardships and sufferings. When we truly desire to do the Lord's will, we have to accept whatever comes with it. <clears throat> you know, I have some, I'll give you an example. I've got some health issues I'm struggling with right now, I'm dealing with right now. And I've prayed and prayed and prayed for the Lord to heal me. And I prayed and prayed and prayed for the Lord to take this away. But at the end of the day, if that's what keeps me humble, if that's what keeps me to be in a place where God can use me and God can fill me and God can mold me and God can make me into what He wants me to be, then I welcome it. <clears throat> because our desire to please the Lord should overshadow our desire to avoid hardships and sufferings. Sometimes the Lord might have to bring hardships and sufferings in our lives to get us to the place that He wants us to use us. So Paul's a good example of that. And uh, I think he's being a, a very good example to us here. 
Look at verse 15. And after those days we took up our carriages and went to Jerusalem. There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Nason of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. I like that, an old disciple. So this guy had been around a little while. He was seasoned. He was salty. He would fought some battles. He was a, a prayer warrior and a gray-headed saint, more than likely. And uh, I try to expose you to some old disciples. It's the reason why I have Brother Jeff Walters in here, somebody who's been soul winning for 30, 40 years. Uh, that's why I have Pastor Petrick in here. And I've got some other ones I'm, I'm working on getting right now uh, for our conference, some other guys, you know. And that's why, uh, you know, I try to get some of these old disciples in front of you. So not only can you learn from them, but you can see, hey, you can make it. You can become an old si disciple too. <laughs> you, you can know that it can be said about you one day that you're an old disciple. Because you can't make it. If I can make it and I can serve the Lord and live for the Lord now, coming up on I, uh, let's see. I've been saved now for 24 years. I've been serving the Lord now for about 22. Haven't always been what I should be, but praise God, I ain't what I used to be. And look, if I can serve the Lord, you can serve the Lord. If I can make it, you can make it. Pastor, P Pastor Peter can make it, you can make it. If this old disciple can make it, you can make it. Amen. Look at verse 17. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul uh, went in with us unto James. And all the elders were present. So Paul's finally made it to Jerusalem. He comes to Jerusalem. The brethren welcome him. They receive him. Paul goes into James. This is the brother of Jesus. He's the lead, one of the leaders at the, of the church here in Jerusalem. And all the elders were present. This church was so big, they had to have multiple elders. They had to have multiple pastors. They had one overall in charge. There's always got to be one guy in charge. So they had one guy in charge, and then they had other assistant pastors that worked for him. And uh, Verse 19, And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. So he was excited to share the news, excited to share all these Gentiles that got saved. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. So they're kind of giving him a report, too. Hey, we got good news, too. Look at all these thousands of Jews which have been saved. Now, notice it says thousands. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of thousands. All right. And the reason why I wanted to point that out here is because, look, during these early days in the book of Acts, a lot of Jews were getting saved. And here's the bottom line. The good Jews who believed in the Old Testament law and believed in Jehovah, they got saved. And the rest, became, the rest were of the Pharisees. Think about that. The good Jews received Christ. The rest of them rejected Him. And the Pharisee, Pharisaical religion is what continued. Uh, yeah. So what does that mean exists today? The Pharisaical side of the, of the Judaism. That's what exists today. The good Jews received the, the gospel and believed and got saved. So that's what we have today. We have the religion of the Pharisees is what we have today. Uh, look at verse 21. I got to move on here. And they were informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews. So now they're kind of calling Paul out on the carpet. It says, These Jews which got saved are saying that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Notice that word, customs. Everybody see that? Customs. So, these are saved Jews who want to know... Why is Paul? I think they're falsely accusing him. They're false. These are saved Jews that are falsely accusing Paul of teaching that saved Jews don't have to follow the customs anymore. The customs of the Jewish religion. I don't like that word customs. That's very important. Saying they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. 
So here's what's going on. Paul, again, is being called out on the red carpet. He's being questioned. Hey, why are you telling the saved Jews that they don't have to follow the Jewish customs? Do you remember back in Acts chapter 15, there was this Jerusalem council, council that settled the issue that Gentile believers do not need to be circumcised. Everybody remember that? Now, the question at hand back in Acts 15 was not, do the Gentiles have to be back, circumcised to be saved? That was never the argument. Now, there were those that were preaching that, but not the Jerusalem council. The Jerusalem council was saved. There were those who said you have, who were trying to add circumcision to salvation. That's why Paul wrote the book of Galatians. To show that it wasn't necessary, which happened around the same... The book of Galatians, if you study this out, I believe you'll see that the book of Galatians was written around the same time frame as Acts chapter 15 when this Jerusalem council was taking place. All right. Those of the Jerusalem council were saved and they understood circumcision was not for salvation but for custom, for custom's sake. The same thing these Jews here who are saved, these thousands of Jews who were saved, are attacking Paul, falsely accusing Paul of saying that these Jews don't have to follow customs anymore. Now if you'll go back and study the Jerusalem Council, Acts chapter 15, you will see the Jerusalem Council came to the consensus that the Gentiles didn't need to be circumcised for custom's sake. But they never said that about the Jews. Even the saved Jews kept circumcising and doing certain things contained in the law, like sacrificing for a little while. Why? Custom's sake. It was their custom. It was what they were raised doing. It was their custom. It was their tradition. See, the book of Hebrews had not been written yet, and they, they were still in a transition period. It was still a, a lot of this stuff was still new to them. Yeah, they were saved. They didn't really understand everything. They didn't have, completely have the whole big picture yet from the book of Hebrews. So they were doing certain things for custom's sake. They had some deep, ingrained customs. Now, my opinion is the reason they did these customs. They... They even, like Paul, uh, uh, allow them to continue some of these customs. And even Paul participated in some of these customs. Don't miss this. Was for the picture that it painted. Look, some were falsely accusing Paul of taking away their customs. But I believe Paul... He didn't do that. You, you, you'll never find anywhere where Paul... Now, you'll find where Paul said, hey, circumcision isn't necessary for salvation. But you'll never find... These people are falsely accusing Paul. You'll never find... He told the Gentiles they didn't have to do. And I, I stand to be correct. If somebody can show me where Paul addressed the Jewish believers and told them not to circumcise, then I'd like to see it. I, I stand to be corrected. I believe that they were still continuing these customs of circumcision, customs of the, the, some of the sacrifices, is because they probably thought the sacrifices and circumcisions were good pictures. See, circumcision, I believe they thought, well, it's a good thing because of the picture. What, what is a picture? Circumcision pictures the fact that, hey, we're supposed to have our hearts circumcised by faith. Uh, you know, the sacrifice was a good picture. Hey, Jesus is this little lamb. Jesus, you know, he came to become this little lamb. So, I believe possibly they were doing so many sacrifices, even though they were saved, they were still doing so many sacrifices still doing some of these Jewish customs for the picture that it painted. That's my personal opinion. I can't think of any reason why else they'd be doing it. They were saved. You can't be saved if you're still trying to, you know, sacrifice a lamb and work your way to heaven or anything like that, even though sacrifice a lamb never was for heaven. It never got you salvation. It got mercy. 
That's what it got. It didn't get, it didn't get grace. It got mercy. Grace has always been through faith. Mercy oftentimes is through the work, works and the law and obedience is what you can get mercy from. Grace is by faith. All right, so I believe it's possible they could have been still doing some of these things in this transition period they were in. Kind of the reason, kind of similar to how, why, why, why we do communion. You know, we do communion because it's a picture. It allows us to remember the blood of Jesus that he shed for us. His flesh that he allowed, that he sacrificed. Uh, baptism. Baptism is a great picture. A picture of the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Down with the old man, up with the new man. A lot of pictures. This is my opinion. Again, I could be wrong. But here's the deal. I would rather be wrong about why they were doing what they were doing than to be wrong about Paul being a compromiser. Good. See, a lot of people want to accuse Paul of kind of being a middle of the road Baptist. A lot of people want to accuse Paul of basically kind of compromise and trying to please these Jews. Not so worried about pleasing God. He just wants to please these Jews. So that's the reason why he's going along with some of these vows, some of these Nazarite vows. That's the reason why he's going along with the sacrifice here. That's why he's going along with circumcision and circumcising Timothy and some of these things. Look, <clears throat> I would rather be wrong about you know, the reason why they're doing these things than to, 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 to accuse Paul of being a compromiser. Uh, I have enough confidence in a man who wrote the majority of the New Testament to know that he wasn't a compromiser. Now, now that, 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 that temptation is definitely out there. Don't get me wrong. That temptation is out there, and that temptation to be a, a people pleaser and a compromiser is a serious threat to a pastor. Serious threat. And I've known a lot of pastors to fall victim to that mindset. You've got to please people. got to compromise. got to bring in the rock bands. got to soften up the message. Can't preach on sin too hard. Can't preach on this. Can't preach on that. That temptation's definitely there. And it is possible that Paul fell victim to that, but I don't think so. I, 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 like I say, I, I just have more confidence in, in the man of God who, who wrote the majority of the New Testament. Again, the reason why I see Paul going along with some of these things is because I believe he wanted to maintain influence with the Jews because many of them were not saved yet. And he wanted to get his foot in the door and in. He wanted to have an in with them. And he probably had the mindset that, look, yeah, he knew that those sacrifices, that sacrifice, he knew that circumcision was not required anymore. But I believe he had the mindset, well, it paints a good picture, and it's not a sin to do it. It's not necessarily a sin to do it. And he understood that they were in a transition period. It's kind of like going to an altar call at a church, a Baptist church. You don't have to go down to an altar and pray in front of people. But it's not a sin to do it. It's not a sin. It's not a sin to go forward and pray at an altar at a Baptist church. And I'm not going to attack people. I'm not going to make that a big deal. I don't like it when they have altar calls for salvation because it makes it difficult for people to get saved. But a lot of altar calls are just for Christians to come down and be able to pray and share their heart with the Lord and you know, respond to maybe a, a moving sermon. It's not a sin. And, and maybe that's kind of like Paul's mindset. Hey, it's not a sin for them to sacrifice as long as they're not doing it for salvation, which it never was. It's not a sin for them to circumcise as long as they're not doing it for salvation, and it never was. Some thought it was. And here's the deal. Paul, I believe, understands right now during this transition period, but the book of Hebrews brought this transition period to an end. The book of Hebrews is what really starts revoking things and kind of really, uh, you know, setting the record straight. I may be wrong on that. I'm not dogmatic on anything I just preached to you. I'm just giving you my opinion on what's going on. All right, so again, I may be wrong, but I'm just, that, that's how I understand it. That's how I look at it. If you've got a different idea, different interpretation, I'd be, I'd be, uh, uh, I'd like to hear it, you know. But that, that, that's how I reconcile all this. This is some pretty heavy stuff, man. Paul, we're fixing to see him do a sacrifice. <laughs> Why are you doing that, Paul? I believe 
well, I just explained to you why I feel he was doing that. All right, verse 22. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. This is a Nazarite vow. Take them and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things were of, they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but thou thyself also walkest orderly, and thou keepest the law. So again, they're doing these things for custom's sake, not salvation. It's a custom. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing. Uh, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangling and from fornication. So what they're saying is, hey, we told, those, we told those Gentiles they didn't have to do that, but we didn't tell the Jews because that's our custom. Then Paul took them in the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. So here we see Paul taking part in some of these Jewish customs. Uh, again, I think he was just a good textbook example of I had become all things to all men and I might by all means gain some. And a lot of people want to abuse that and say, oh, well, I got, we got, if we want to get rock and roll people, you know, we want to reach rock and roll people, then we have to have rock and roll music. Or, you know, if we want to reach people that are drunks, then we have to go hang out in a bar. No, that's not what Paul's doing here. Paul is just, and I really don't know how this would be very applicable for us today. But, I, you know, I don't know what else I can say about it. But look, Acts chapter 15, if you want to listen to that sermon, you, I'm not going to go in here and, and deal with these specific things. Why they commanded, why does Jerusalem Council commanded them to abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from strangle, from fornication? You can go in, you can listen to Acts chapter 15, sermon on that. Verse 27, And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! So it's funny that he would be calling out help. Uh, it's like they're in trouble, like they're drowning or something. Help, help. This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law in this place and further brought Greeks also into the temple and have polluted this holy place. So now we're getting ready to see come to fruition what they, what they prophesied. Now we're getting ready to see come to fruition what the Holy Spirit told those disciples was going to happen to Paul. So here he went ahead, went through it, he went to Jerusalem, and now this is getting ready to play out. And I don't have time to look at all of it. But, uh, so, you know, they cry out, help, help. And they go, they, they go to kill him, but he's rescued by soldiers. And uh, these soldiers step in. <clears throat> so men of Israel, so these Jews are trying to kill him. And these soldiers step in. And the reason why these soldiers rescue Paul is because uh, the rulers of this city, the leaders of the city, could get in trouble for not keeping the peace. You know, if they, they were uh, guilty of having riots or a disturbance, they could get fired from being like the, the city manager or the city, you know, the mayor or whatever. So, these soldiers run in to keep peace. These are peacekeeping. These are UN peacekeeping troops is what this is. And they bind Paul with chains. Look at verse 37. I've got to skip over some of this. Look at verse 37. And as Paul was led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art thou not an Egyptian? Which were before these days made an uproar, and led us out to the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers, but Paul said, I'm a man uh, which, am of, uh, which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. So next week we're going to get into what he says. So Paul is getting ready to have an opportunity uh, to speak to the pe people. So he's, is, it, it seems like to me he's speaking to some people. In, in, he's, he's, one of the things, he's, he's speaking in Greek. Uh, because he wants to be thought of as, you know, being... He wants people to take him serious. 
So he starts to start speaking in Greek. But I want to point one thing out before we close, and I want you all to pay attention to this. I want you to point, I want to point one thing out before we close. Think of verse 38. Art not thou that what? Egyptian. Paul is the third true-blooded Jew that has been mistaken for an Egyptian. Moses was mistook for an Egyptian when Jethro's daughter saw him at the well. They went and told their dad, hey, an Egyptian. Who else was mistook, mistaken for an Egyptian? Somebody help me out. Joseph. You remember Joseph's brothers thought he was an Egyptian. They had no idea. They thought So Paul, the apostle, is being mistaken for an Egyptian. So what does that tell us? <laughs> God's people, God's original chosen Israelites, were what color? Brown. They weren't a bunch of white European proselytes from Poland. That's right. Which is what the modern day nation of Israel says. Them bunch of them bunch of proselytes to a false religion called Judaism ain't a bit more of Abraham's pure-blooded seed. And I am a Cherokee Indian. God's people were kicked out. When I say, hey, we're God's people because we're saved. We're blood-bought, born again, blood-washed. Ye who, are one, you who used to be afar off are now made nigh by the blood of Christ, says Ephesians chapter 2. We are the commonwealth of Israel. We are true Israel. And that bunch of Israel over there is a fraud. Right. It's a fraud. They're a bunch of white people. <clears throat> Benjamin Netanyahu's last name is Malakowski. <laughs> Doesn't sound too Israelitish to me. Somebody, somebody find me Malachowski in the Bible. So and so begot Malachowski. Show me that in the Bible, please. That's look, when God when God kicked them out of Palestine in AD 70, they looked like Egyptians when they left out of there. And when they came back, they looked like me. In Austin. White. And Brother Bobby. Because that's because they're they're fraudulent. They're fraudulent, and uh, it's a manifestation. Modern Israel is a manifestation of the satanic United Nations. Study it out. Go back and study your history. See who brought them into existence. The one world nation, or I'm sorry, United Nations. That should be your first red flag. Right. Have you read Revelation? Have you seen that there's this thing called a one world government in the book of Revelation? That's right. So anytime the one world government, the United Nations, does something, that should be your first red flag. It's probably not good. They're the ones that brought them back. They're the ones that propped them up. They're the ones that stole the land from the Palestinians to give it to members of a false religion. Satan is propping up where he's going to rule the world from. That's what it boils down to. And I just wanted to point out the fact that when they left out of there, they were tan. And when they came back, they were tan or brown. And when they came back, they were white. Now, how'd that happen? All right, let's pray.